So welcome to this uh, course on electronic circuits. So in this particular class, uh, we will be discussing about uh, some fundamental problems, some numerical problems, and uh, I will help you to solve those problems. Now, since uh, this is the uh, first class, uh, first tutorial class uh, on electronic circuits, so it would have been better uh, to start with some uh, warm-up problem. Now, in connection to uh, the lecture one of uh, the electronic circuits theory paper, let us uh, first consider a simple circuit like this. And uh, in this entire analysis, uh, we will uh, assume that uh, we are using silicon diode. Okay. So let's start with this circuit. We have a battery, a DC voltage source. Then we have a resistance, one diode, and another battery. A very simple circuit to start with. Okay. So uh, these are the polarities, positive side of the battery, negative side of the battery, this side positive, this side negative. And let me mark uh, the corresponding values. Uh, let us assume that this value is equal to five volt and this value is equal to eight volt. And uh, this resistance is having a value of 10 ohms. And we have a diode. Now, uh, in the entire analysis, as I've already mentioned, uh, we'll be assuming silicon diode. Now, uh, first of all, uh, you have to uh, identify uh, whether uh, the silicon diode, as we are considering in this particular example, whether this is in the forward bias or reverse bias condition. So the question is uh, whether the diode is in the forward bias condition or in the reverse bias condition. So there are different parts of the question. So the first part says that you have to identify whether the diode is under forward bias or reverse bias. So to answer this question, first of all, you have to identify how the, the anode and the cathode terminals of the diodes are connected. As you know, uh, for any diode, so if I, if I draw the diode in isolation, this is the symbol of diode. And uh, you must be knowing that we have two different terminals for diode. So this terminal is known to be the anode terminal, and this terminal is known to be the cathode terminal. Now this uh, anode to cathode potential, this DAK, should be greater than some value. If I if I call like uh, V gamma, it should be greater than V gamma so that the diode starts conduction. That means in order to ensure that the diode uh, carries some amount of current or it is in the forward bias condition, so the anode to cathode voltage should be greater than some V gamma voltage. Now here, uh, we are considering two different uh, models of the diode. First one is the ideal model, and the second one is the constant voltage model. So you must be knowing that for ideal model, this uh, anode to cathode voltage should be greater than zero. So then only we can say that uh, the diode uh, will be conducting. And uh, obviously, we will be considering the uh, constant voltage model later on. And apart from that, uh, we have a complete diode model, in which case, uh, apart from this constant uh, voltage, uh, the dynamic resistance of the diode is also associated with. That means uh, the dynamic resistance of the diode in forward bias condition and in the reverse bias condition. So I'm not uh, coming into that complexity right now. Let's first uh, assume that uh, we have a silicon diode uh, whose anode is connected over here. So this is the anode terminal. This is connected over here. Cathode is connected over here. And you have to identify whether the diode is in the forward bias condition or in the reverse bias condition. So you have to identify that, uh, okay, uh, so this anode, uh, so if there is no flow of current initially, so then the anode potential, so VA over here, the anode potential is equal to eight, eight, 5 volt. VA is equal to 5 volt. And VK, that is the cathode potential, is equal to 8 volt. So the anode potential is equal to 
5 volt and the cathode potential is equal to 8 volt so uh, if you can uh, calculate uh, this anode to cathode drop i mean this anode to cathode voltage difference is vak is obvious that it is negative that is uh, minus 3 volt so it's less than zero so therefore for this given consideration irrespective of uh, the ideal model or the constant voltage model since the anode to cathode voltage is negative so obviously the diode will not be conducting so the answer is since the anode to cathode potential is going to be negative over here so the diode will not conduct so this is a very fundamental problem to start with now uh, let us move uh, one level higher it's not actually one level higher uh, rather another uh, different kind of arrangement but obviously uh, this particular the second circuit is having uh, some other implications that you need to understand as well as an engineer so the second circuit uh, looks something like that we have only one voltage source this is grounded so uh, suppose uh, this uh, voltage is equal to 100 volt and uh, this is equal to 560 ohms so once again the same question whether this diode uh, is in uh, forward bias condition or in the reverse bias condition the same question is also applicable over here and you have to identify now if you check uh, once again uh, here uh, the cathode potential so the cathode uh, terminal is connected to the negative uh, side of the battery and the anode terminal is connected to the ground potential so obviously here as you can see uh, this anode potential va is equal to 0 volt that is fine 0 volt and the cathode potential is equal to say minus 100 because the negative terminal of the battery is connected to that so therefore this vak this vak this uh, anode to cathode uh, voltage difference is obviously greater than zero it's much larger it's greater than zero and in fact it's very large so you must argue that okay uh, the diode uh, will be in the forward bias condition because uh, the anode to cathode voltage is greater than zero even if we consider uh, the constant voltage model assuming that uh, we have a 0.7 volt drop for a silicon diode and then also Uh, this 100 volt minus 0.7, so more than 90 volt. So obviously, it will drive the diode in the conducting region. So uh, you must argue that uh, the uh, diode will be in the forward bias condition, unlike the the first one. In the first case, the diode was in the reverse bias condition uh, because the anode potential was less as compared to the cathode potential. But here, the uh, situation is just the opposite, just the reverse. But while saying so you have to take a look at this particular uh, resistance so this resistance is equal to 560 ohms only as compared to 100 volt this is 560 ohms so now uh, if you calculate the current that will be flowing because if the diode is uh, a forward bias obviously the current will be flowing so that current if i call that current say let it be say that current is id so this id is nothing but i'm assuming okay uh, constant voltage model if you assume constant voltage model then there will be 100 minus 0.7 otherwise uh, i can simply write 100 volt divided by 560 ohms that is the current very simple so now uh, i'm talking calculus so uh, if you just take 100 to 100 divided by 560 it will give you uh, 0.178 ampere amount of current 0.178 ampere so for a low power diode so it's almost uh, that is uh, 100 so 178 or 179 anyway so 178 milliampere amount of current so for the normal a uh, low power diode as we are considering over here for this normal low power diode this 178 milliampere is is pretty large normally uh, the maximum amount of current that the diode can withstand is uh, in the range of few say 50 50 mi milliampere to max to max 75 milliampere not more than that so that is uh, given in the manufacturer data sheet that ideally uh, as you know uh, that we can use the diode as a switch 
as an electronic switch and uh, but uh, the thing is that it's not a it's not an ideal switch it's a practical switch so as far as the property of the ideal switch is concerned under the forward bias condition uh, it can it can carry any amount of current ideally infinite amount of current but that is not the case there is a limitation so for the low power diode it cannot conduct more than uh, 50 uh, milliampere amount of current. So at max, you can consider 100 milliampere. Even 100 milliampere is too large. Similarly, when the diode is in the reverse bias condition, then also any amount of voltage it cannot withstand. There is a particular value which we call like a peak inverse voltage. That is the maximum inverse voltage that the diode can withstand in the reverse bias condition. Otherwise, the diode will enter into the, the breakdown region. So that is not at all our desirable property. So although here you see that uh, the diode uh, is in the forward bias condition because uh, the anode potential is more than the cathode potential, uh, but the amount of current is pretty large. So in order to restrict the current or in order to ensure that the diode will be conducting, it will, it will not be damaged, it will not get damaged, to ensure that either uh, you have to minimize this uh, voltage because uh, that overdrive voltage is very large, you don't require 100 volt, you, you, only 10 volt would be good enough. In that case, the current will be like 17.8 uh, milliampere. That would have been fine. Otherwise, what you need to do is that uh, you have to increase uh, this uh, limiting resistance. This is also known as a limiting resistance, which can limit uh, the current that is flowing through the diode. So instead of using 560 ohms, so if you use the uh, resistance in the order of say a few kilo ohms, like 10 kilo ohms or 20 kilo ohms, then obviously uh, it will reduce this amount of current. So although in this case uh, you find that uh, the silicon diode is in the forward bias condition but it cannot uh, sustain its operation for long because the amount of current flowing through the diode is very large and ultimately it will destroy the device, right? So now uh, let's uh, move to uh, the another, another uh, a little bit uh, complicated circuit. And this, the same question uh, uh, we do have, that is we have to identify whether the diode uh, is in the forward bus condition uh, or uh, in the reverse bias condition. And uh, accordingly, you have to identify what about the voltage across the diode. So now the circuit is something like that. You have a battery over here, a resistance. Another resistance over here. Third resistance and the fourth one. And we connect the diode in this manner. So uh, let us call uh, this voltage to be say 30 volt. Uh, this is 1k resistance. Uh, this is uh, 1.5k resistance. Uh, this is 4.7k uh, resistance. And this one is also 4.7k. So the question is the same. You have to identify whether the diode is in the forward bias condition or in the reverse bias condition. And accordingly, uh, you have to find out what should be the voltage across the diode. And what you can also do is uh, you can find out uh, the current that is that is flowing through the circuit, the diode current. So there is an ad additional part. We can also find out the current that is flowing through the diode. So the first of all, uh, you have to identify uh, whether uh, the diode will be in the in the forward bias condition or in the reverse bias condition. Now take a look at this uh, voltage source. So here we have a 30 volt as a DC power supply and there is a ground connection. So there is no negative uh, voltage source, only the positive voltage source of 30 volt is present over here. So at any point, so you do have different points. So this is one point. So I may call this point as point X. This point can be treated as point X. 
there is another point over here. There is another point over here. So at every point, either this one or this one or here, the maximum voltage cannot exceed 30 volt because 30 volt is the is the voltage of the battery. And the minimum voltage should be greater than or equal to zero volt. That means within zero to 30 volt, all the voltages are distributed. Now, if you just take a look at this diode, you will find that the cathode is connected to the ground. That means the cathode potential is equal to zero. There is no doubt about that VK, the cathode potential of the diode is equal to zero volt. And what about the anode potential? So anode potential means the potential at this point. So if I call this point as point Y, so I don't know what about this voltage. Now, since the maximum voltage can be 30 and the minimum voltage cannot be negative because we don't have any negative uh, power supply over here. So we may initially assume that the diode will be conducting. And we have to check whether this assumption is correct for us or not. So let us assume that the diode will be conducting because if I assume that this voltage is greater than the minimum voltage required for the diode to be in the forward bias condition, that means this voltage should be a little bit positive. In that case, the diode will be conducting. There will be no problem about that. So we have to identify that particular voltage. Now, if we just uh, take a look at this particular circuit, we will find that over here, if the diode is conducting, so in that case, uh, I may assume that suppose the current through this branch, let me call this current is equal to I1. And current through this branch, let me call this current is I2. And assuming that I2 is non-zero. If I2 is equal to zero, that means if the diode doesn't conduct, if the diode is in the reverse bias condition, then obviously the entire amount of current will be flowing through this path. So the entire current will be flowing through this path. Now we have to check what about the status of the diode. So let us assume that this kind is I1 and this kind is I2. So I2 can be zero as well, but we have to check. And then obviously, if you just apply KCL at this particular node, at node X, then obviously you understand that the current that is flowing uh, through this branch is nothing but the summation of these two currents, that is I1 plus I2. Right? So now uh, you have to apply uh, the kit of some voltage, whether it's KVL. Now we can uh, say that uh, I is equal to I1 plus I2. That is the total current being supplied. We can also call this to be I. That is equal to I1 plus I2 anyway. So what we find is if I apply uh, KVL over here, we will find that the same kind will be flowing through this 1k resistance and this 1.5k resistance. So since they are in the series path, so it will be 2.5k resistance. And then over here, uh, we have a 4.7k resistance. And the current is equal to I1, it's not I. Part of the current gets distributed through this path. So uh, if I just uh, write down the expression, I mean the KVL equation, it will be like that. 30 minus 2.5. So I'm writing in terms of, uh, so it will be actually 2.5K. So 2.5 multiplied 10 to the power 3. But if I assume that uh, the current that you'll be getting uh, after, after the calculation, if it is in the milliampere range, then I can uh, simply write 2.5I to make the uh, calculation simple. Assuming that uh, all the currents are in the milliampere range. And minus uh, 4.7 I1, that is equal to zero. So if I apply KVL in this particular loop, then you can find this one. And then, if I consider this path, where the current is equal to I2, Then uh, what we find is 
through this path the current flowing is i1 and through this path the current flowing is i2 and if i assume that the diode is a is a con is following the constant voltage model then the diode will be replaced or diode can be replaced uh, by means of so this diode can be replaced by means of a battery of voltage 0.7 volt because that is the basic notion of the constant voltage model so this is plus this is minus and we have a 0.7 volt over here so now uh, if i just compare uh, the i mean from this point so if i just consider or if i just calculate uh, the potential at point x that is vx through this path and through this path so they will be the same because they are in the shunt shunt path so through this path uh, this is 4.7 times i1 and through this path so when the current flows so plus minus and another plus minus so gets added a uh, 4.7 i2 plus 0.7 so what we get is 4.7 i1 is equal to 4.7 i2 plus 0.7 so that is uh, another equation that we are getting and obviously uh, we can replace this i by i1 plus i2 so uh, from that so if i call this to be equation number 1 and this to be equation number 2 so from 1 what we are getting is uh, 30 minus 2.5 i1 minus 2.5 i2 because i is equal to i1 plus i2 minus 4.7 i1 is equal to 0 that means uh, we have 2.5 plus 4.7 that means uh, 4 uh, 7 5 12 7.7.2 uh, so 30 minus 30 minus 7.2 i1 minus 2.5 i2 that is equal to 0 or in other words uh, you can write like 7.2 i1 plus 2.5 i2 is equal to 30 so this is uh, this i can call like equation number 3 and from equation number 2 we have 4.7 i1 minus 4.7 i2 is equal to 0.7 so now i do have to this uh, i do have uh, these two equations so let me once again write it down so we have this equation like 7.2 i1 plus 2.5 i2 that is equal to 30 and i have 4.7 i1 minus 4.7 i2 is equal to 0.7 so uh, what i can do is i can make it uh, i mean for this equation the second one i can multiply the entire thing with 2.5 by 4.7 if i multiply this one this equation so let me call this to be equation number 3 and this to be equation number 4 and if you multiply 4 with 2.5 by 4.7 so this is just the mathematical calculation what you are getting is it's simply 2.5 i1 over here minus 2.5 i2 now i have to check this value all uh, this value is like uh, 2.5 into 0.7 divided 4.7 so that value is equal to 0.37 so i may call it equation number 5 and now if i uh, simply add 3 and 5 together
then it gives me 7.2 i mean 2.5 i2 gets cancelled so 9.7 so 9.7 i1 is equal to 30.37 And I1 is equal to, let me check the value, 30.37 divided 9.7. So that value is coming like 3.13. And as I have told you, so the unit should be milliampere. So I1 is equal to 3.13 milliampere because uh, we have just multiplied, we have just ignored these uh, kilo ohms over there. So that's why it is uh, in the uh, order of milliampere. So I1 is equal to 3.13 milliampere. And what about I2? So you can uh, easily uh, calculate I2 from any of the equations. So let me take the fifth equation, I mean the equation number five. So 2.5 I1, so 2.5 into 3.13 uh, minus 0.37 divided by 2.5. And it's like 2.98. So we're getting I2 to be 2.98. 9.8 milliampere and you can easily calculate the total current the total current is the summation of these two 3.13 plus 2.98 and it is giving like 6.11 6.11 milliampere Now that calculation has been done uh, using the constant voltage model of the diode. That means we have assumed that we have assumed that uh, we do have this uh, diode has been uh, replaced by a battery of uh, 0.7 volt only with the polarity as shown. Now, if I assume that okay, uh, it's like an ideal diode. So in that case, uh, uh, these two terminal, I mean, this anode and cathode, they are short circuited. So anode and cathode, they are short circuited. And under this condition, uh, only this uh, second equation will be modified to some extent. Because now what you have is 4.7 I1, because if this is short circuited, if uh, uh, this diode is an ideal one, so in that case, obviously, uh, this potential must be equal to uh, this, I mean, the cathode potential, or in other words, this VAK voltage drop must be equal to zero volt. So here you have 4.7K, you have another 4.7K in shunt path. So if this kind is I1, this kind is I2, then uh, the second equation gets modified like uh, 4.7 I1 is equal to 4.7 I2. Right? I mean, uh, since uh, the current will find equal resistance at point X, so obviously I1 and I2 must be equal to same. And the first equation obviously uh, holds good, that is 30 is equal to 2.5 uh, I1 plus I2. Uh, plus uh, 4.7 I1. Uh, so now uh, with this, uh, you can uh, once again calculate uh, what about the current. And obviously, uh, in that particular case, uh, the amount of current should be a little bit more as compared to the 6.11 milliampere. We can, uh, you can also calculate the same thing. Uh, or uh, otherwise, I think uh, it, this can be kept as an exercise. Or anyhow, we can solve it, no problem. We have to just uh, change uh, the equation number two only. That is 4.7 I1 is equal to 4.7 I2. That means I1 is equal to I2. That is the condition that you have to impose over here. So what we can do is uh, we can take uh, equation number one only that is 2.5 i1 plus i2 so this is with constant voltage model so let me write it down with the constant voltage model Now, if I consider ideal model of the diode, so for ideal model, uh, the equation will be something like that. Uh, we have uh, obviously I1 is equal to I2. That is quite obvious because we do have a same resistance 4.7K. 
each of the branch and they are connected in shunt path so obviously the current will be divided equally and uh, then we have 30 minus 2.5 i minus 4.7 i1 is equal to 0 so that means uh, 30 minus you can write like 5 i1 because i is equal to twice i1 minus 4.7 i1 so the calculation gets a little bit simple so ultimately what you find is 9.7 i1 is equal to 30 I one is equal to. So let me just uh, check what is the value. Thirty divided by nine point seven will give us a three point zero nine milliampere amount of current. Three point zero nine milliampere. And same is I two. So the total current that is I as supplied by the circuit I one plus I two is equal to six point one eight. milliampere now last time what we have got is uh, the current was like 6.11 milliampere and since we are assuming here the ideal model so using ideal model the current gets increased because this 0.7 volt drop is not uh, taking place over here so apart from that uh, you do have uh, another model that is known as a practical diode model so the practical diode model is very interesting to uh, analyze so now uh, if i just uh, briefly uh, go through that part for the practical diode model as you know uh, you have a diode like this this is the anode terminal this is the cathode terminal now between a to k between n to cathode this is perfect short circuit it for ideal model of the diode it's perfect short circuit like this this is for ideal so this is a this is k what about the constant voltage model for constant voltage model you do have a situation like this this one plus this one minus and uh, this is uh, this value so this one is a this one is k this is a constant voltage model constant voltage model and that value we we normally refer like uh, we normally refer like uh, v gamma so this v gamma obviously it will vary uh, depending upon the material with which you have uh, constructed the diode whether it's silicon diode or germanium diode or gallium arsenide diode so normally for silicon diode this v gamma is equal to 0.7 volts so obviously that voltage is constant as far as our understanding goes but in fact this voltage is not also constant it depends upon the temperature heavily but let us assume that this temperature dependence we can just uh, get rid of and if i just consider that okay uh, you need some voltage some amount of non zero voltage to make the diode on so that voltage is constant for a particular type of the diode if i consider a silicon diode then it will be 0.7 volt otherwise for germanium diode it could have been 0.3 volt or so so that is the basic uh, understanding regarding the constant voltage model now for the practical diode model what we have is between anode to cathode apart from this v gamma this is a, this is the voltage reference voltage apart from this v gamma uh, we have uh, uh, another important term which is known as the resistance the dynamic resistance of the diode and remember all these three that we have, i have shown over here uh, this is uh, in connection uh, with the consideration that the diode is in forward bias condition so then only you can have a situation like this otherwise in the reverse bias condition as you know this anode to cathode potential i mean uh, if the diode is in reverse bias condition then it will be open circuited 
And now, uh, if I just consider the practical diode models, so then uh, in case of practical diode model, apart from this V gamma, uh, you do have a resistance in series with that. So this is the practical diode model. So this is anode terminal, cathode terminal, and uh, this one is plus minus V gamma. Apart from that, you have a resistance. And this one is known as a practical diode model. Practical model of the diode. So in fact, uh, practical model. So in fact, we have started with uh, normally uh, we have a tendency to start with the ideal model and then uh, we uh, add on the different types of complexity. Initially, I assume that uh, these anode to cathode they are short circuited. There is no, uh, I mean, uh, there is no resistance between them. There is no voltage between them. That is fine. Then let us introduce the, the voltage, the constant voltage between the anode to cathode. And then let us introduce uh, a resistance, a dynamic resistance with that, so that we are increasing the complexity of the problem uh, gradually. Because initially, if you start with a practical model, then uh, uh, the people will, would get uh, nervous uh, at the very beginning. So it would have been better to start with the uh, simpler model and then uh, add on the complexity gradually. So now we can analyze the same circuit uh, with the practical diode model. So uh, very uh, briefly, what I can do is I can I can draw the circuit, the equivalent circuit. So what we have is uh, I'm not going to solve the equation once once more. So what we have is uh, we have a voltage source over here, a DC supply. We have a one k resistance over here. Hopefully one k. Yeah. Is 1k and then 1.5k over here and 4.7k here and we do have a 4.7k here so let me just mark this is 30 volt this is 1k this is 1.5k this is 4.7k resistance you have a 4.7k over here as well and you would have a diode over here between this point and ground. Now, if I assume that's a practical diode model, so in that case, uh, what I need to do is uh, I have to replace this one with a battery and with a small dynamic resistance of the diode, assuming that uh, it is in the power bias condition. And that voltage, this anode to cathode drop, I mean, this one is 0 0.7 volt, assuming it's a Silicon diode and this dynamic resistance, uh, uh, let, let, let us assume that this is like 10 ohms. It's pretty small, 10 ohms. So now the uh, circuit gets modified like this. So now, once again, you have to, uh, you may have to calculate uh, the, the amount of current uh, that will be flowing uh, through the diode. Then uh, you have to rewrite the uh, KVL equation once again, taking into account. Uh, on this uh, 0 0.7 volt, uh, this particular voltage, and uh, obviously this uh, 10 ohm uh, resistance over here. So you can consider that uh, this current is I1, this current is I2, and accordingly, uh, you may have to find out the new value of I1 and I2. And this is coming uh, from the practical model of the diode, right? The value of RT will be given. RT will be given, yeah. Pretty small. Uh, you can also calculate uh, if if uh, the um, if the temperature is given to some extent. You can also calculate because if you know the slope, if, uh, perhaps you know the equation of the I mean the I, I characteristics of the diode. How does this uh, current change with the uh, with the applied voltage? And if the parameter like eta and uh, the temperature is given because it's an ultimate it's a function of temperature and the Boltzmann constant. You know uh, the value of the Boltzmann constant is k. And if the value of eta is given, then you can also calculate. If it is not given, you can also calculate. But otherwise, uh, for any uh, numerical problem, it will be given that, OK, you assume that uh, the value of RT is equal to 10 ohms. Now, that value is very small when the device is operating in the in the forward bias condition. And if the device operates uh, in the reverse bias condition, uh, then the value will be very large. And under this condition, it will have been uh, like uh, in the order of mega ohms, very large, hundreds of mega ohms. And under this condition, uh, the amount of current uh, will be in the in the range of few uh, nano ampere 
or microampere. So you can just neglect that amount. With respect to milliampere, if you have some microampere amount of current, because once again, if, if I just uh, draw the IV characteristics uh, over here, you know. So uh, this is the IV characteristics, I mean, the two axes. And in the reverse bias region, that value is very small unless the breakdown is obtained. So over here, so that current, uh, if you just compare the magnitude of this current with respect to this kind, so that is pretty small. So in the range of a uh, few micro to nano ampere amount of current, so that can be neglected with respect to this forward current. Okay. Okay, fine. So let me move to the next problem. Uh, let me move to the next problem and different with a different circuit, so different circuitry. And uh, so now uh, uh, let me give you the flavor of our different types of circuit analysis. Okay, so it looks something like that. If we have two resistance like this. And the diode is connected over here. You have to check whether the diode will be in forward blast or reverse blast. Uh, let me mention the voltages. So, uh, this is 10 volt, this is 20 volt, and uh, uh, these two resistances are same, 10K each. So now the question is, uh, we have to check uh, whether uh, this particular diode is in a forward bias condition or in reverse bias condition, so that you have to analyze. Now how to solve? So now uh, you do have, uh, so previously, if I just consider the three previous uh, circuits, I have found that there is only one voltage source, most of the cases. And if not, uh, they, they, we have also found uh, for the first case uh, that uh, although we have two different uh, voltage source, but they are in a series path. So accordingly, uh, you can find it out uh, the anode potential and the cathode potential directly. But now uh, the thing is something different because uh, these two are connected in a kind of shunt path. Then how to understand what about the anode to cathode drop or anode to cathode voltage difference. So to answer this question, uh, I have to uh, redraw the circuit like this. So uh, I have to redraw the circuit like this. The same circuit I'm drawing like this. So I may call, uh, yeah, this point is point K, uh, this point is point A. We just take a look. Uh, I have drawn the same circuit. I have just eliminated the data, obviously. That's fine. But uh, apart from that, uh, you do have this. Okay, let me just uh, mark the, the value. Uh, this is uh, actually 10 volt. And this is actually 20 volt. With the polarity as given. 10K over here, 10K over here. So you just check. This 10K is in series with this 10 volt. This 10K is in series with 20 volt. And uh, this terminal is common. That's fine. And these two terminals is also common. And we have connected the diode across these two points. So between this point, and the common branching point between the two resistances. So what I need to do is that I have to actually find out. So actually I have connected the diode between these two terminal. So if that voltage difference, if this VAK is greater than zero volt, assuming that it's an uh, ideal diode model or, uh, or uh, constant voltage model, if it is greater than 0 0.7 volt, then obviously the diode will be conducting. So I have to identify what about, I have to actually calculate what about 
uh, this uh, voltage difference between A to K. So I have uh, redrawn the circuit like this, and then I have to apply. Uh, okay, so uh, now I, I can apply the uh, it was voltage lower here. Uh, assume that uh, the current. So let us assume that this is the direction of the current flow. This is the direction of the current flow, and let us assume that this current is equal to I. So now you can readily find out what is I. So over here, uh, what you find is from this point to this point, we we are moving from minus to plus, and here one second from minus to plus. So if we just uh, follow this uh, anti-clockwise movement, so minus to plus from here to here, and then minus to plus over here to here. So these two voltages will be added together. And what about the resistances? They are in series path. So we have 10K plus 10K. So uh, how to find out the current? So the current I with the polarity as shown. So I is equal to, actually uh, we can write like 10 minus or minus 20 volt, just like this. Minus or minus 20 or 10 plus 20. Same thing. And divided by the total resistance. So total resistance is 10 plus 10. And uh, it will be in the milliampere range because we have voltage in the numerator and kilo ohms in the denominator. So the ratio will be milliampere. So 20 plus 10, 30, 30 by 20. So it will be 1.5 milliampere amount. So 1.5 milliampere amount of current will be flowing. That's fine. So if it is 1.5, so I have to measure uh, this VAK voltage from this point to this point. Or in other words, uh, assuming uh, this to be my uh, reference point, because I have connected the dot in that particular fashion. So assuming this to be the, the reference point, so what about the potential at this one, at this particular point? I have to measure this one as well. So now, if you just calculate this, uh, I mean, you have 1.5 uh, milliampere amount of uh, current that is flowing. So from here to here, when the current will be flowing from this point to that point, so there will be, so you'll be moving from plus to minus, and here you have minus to plus. So here minus to plus 10 volt, and here plus to minus, 15 volt because 10 kilo ohms multiplied with 1.5 milliampere. So kilo into milli will give you the same unit like a volt. 10 into 1.5 will give you 15. So minus to plus and then plus to minus. So ultimately you have plus to minus 5 volt. Or in other words, if you just uh, analyze from this branch here also, you find that the current will be flowing in that direction. So this point will be much more positive as compared to this point. So 10 into 1.5, that is 15. So plus to minus and then minus to plus. So minus 15 plus 20. So in either of these two cases, you'll find that this drop is equal to five volt. Now the question is, the difference is five, that is fine. But which terminal is much more positive with respect to the other terminal. So here you find that if I assume that this point is a reference point, so here you find minus to plus, that's again 10, and then you have plus to minus. So ultimately, this point A is at a higher potential as compared to point K. So that you can verify either uh, analyzing this from this branch or from this branch. So point A is at a higher potential as compared to point B. The point K. Okay. So uh, that drop, uh, what you can find is uh, that difference is equal to five volt. So unless you connect, so over here you find this VAK, this anodocathode drop that is equal to five volt. So that is good enough. 
that is good enough to drive uh, any diode in the in the power bus region because uh, we require at least one volt 0.7 or at least one volt so it is uh, five volt so that is good enough and obviously our answer is uh, the diode will, will be conducting and it is in the uh, forward bias region okay so now uh, if we would like to find out uh, the the current once you once you connect the diode over here and assuming that uh, we do have uh, two different models of the diode that is uh, the ideal diode model and the constant voltage model then and obviously the last one then what would be the the current that is going that is also important over here so let's start with the constant voltage i mean the first one that is ideal model ideal diode model so if it is an ideal diode model and here uh, we cannot make uh, this particular i mean let me first draw the circuit okay let me just change to resistance this is one part and this is the second one so this is 10 volt and this is 20 volt we have 10 k resistance now already have seen that the current uh, i mean uh, if we just uh, we have connected the diode between these two point and that voltage obviously greater than 0 volt so what we can uh, we have a diode over here and uh, if it is in the forward bias region then obviously uh, under ideal model of the diode we can uh, make uh, this two point connected short circuit now once again uh, what is the uh, what is the current that is flowing through the diode we have to uh, find out the current the diode current so now you have uh, two different uh, uh, voltage source on 10 volt and the 20 volt so what you need to do is that and you have uh, the linear devices you have the resistances only uh, so now you can apply uh, the superposition theorem so uh, the superposition theorem says that the overall uh, response overall current due to the presence of these two voltage source of 10 volt and 20 volt is nothing but their algebraic sum of the individual response so let's start with the first uh, voltage i mean the first one that is 10 volt assuming that this one is inactive so how to make it inactive assume that uh, this particular voltage source is ideal that means it doesn't have any resistance a series resistance associated with that so what we can do is you know to make it inactive i can make this point and this point short circuited so then uh, the circuit reduces to so now we have uh, two different circuits initially uh, this 10 volt will be acting alone the 10 volt will be acting alone like this and this is inactive 10 volt 10k 10k and the second one when the 20 volt will be acting alone so then uh, this is the circuit topology now so now uh, this 10 volt has to be made inactive and we have to find out the overall current because of the summation summation algebraic sum of these two so obviously here the current will flow in that path and uh, you must uh, appreciate that obviously there will be no current flowing through this branch through this 10k resistance because at this particular point when the current reaches at this particular point over here so it will find two different path and they are in the shunt connection parallel path one is having a short circuited path with the zero ohm resistance and another one is having a resistance of 10 kilo ohms so if you just calculate the the equivalent resistance that will be zero ohms only or in other words 
it will find a short circuited path minimum resistance and it will follow this path and whatever that current so if i call this current to be say i1 whatever this i1 it's simple 10 volt divided by 10k that is 1 milliampere now considering the second one uh, so here also you find it's 10k it's 10k it's minus plus 20 volt so now you understand that because of the polarity shown, the current will be flowing in this direction. So it was a clockwise current. And uh, this one is, uh, the current will flow in that direction. So now what I would see if I call this current to be I2. So that current I2 is given by 20 volt divided by 10k. That is 2 milliampere amount of current. Now, if you just add them up, so you see that through the diode, you have I1 current in this direction and I2 current in that direction through the diode. So, what about the effective amount of current? So, the effective current that is ID. So here you have uh, 10, uh, 1 milliampere and here you have 2 milliampere. So you can uh, consider uh, this uh, direction to be the, the positive direction of the diode because uh, as you can remember, or if you can remember properly, uh, this is the anode terminal of the diode and this is the cathode terminal. So obviously the current will be flowing from this point to this point. So that direction has to be considered positive, I mean upward direction, and this direction has to be considered negative. So 2 milliampere positive and 1 milliampere negative uh, so uh, the overall current by virtue of the superposition theorem is given by 2 minus 1. That is equal to 1 milliampere. So 1 milliampere will be the amount of diode current assuming the ideal diode model. Okay. So this is with the ideal diode model. So obviously uh, it's a sim simpler one, the simplest one I can say. Apart from that, uh, you do have the other models of the diode as well. Let me just show you the what will be the scenario with the other diode models. And so now uh, let us assume uh, the constant voltage model. So in case of constant voltage model, what we have is we have a 10 volt, we have 10k resistance, another 10k resistance, and we do have This V gamma. So let me just uh, mark the corresponding values. It's 10 volt. It's 20 volt. And it's 10k. It's 10k. And this one is 0 0.7 volt under constant voltage. So now we are following the, the constant voltage model. So it would have been better to write it down. constant voltage model and this one as we have done last time is an ideal model ideal model uh, so now uh, we have uh, three different uh, voltage source so we have to find out the total current because of the presence of these three. So already we have done the exercise for the 10 volt and 20 volt because uh, whenever uh, we have done with the 10 volt, we have made uh, these two terminal uh, short circuited because uh, we have a diode over here and assuming that uh, the diode is an ideal condition. So obviously these two terminals should be short circuited. Now this time we have a diode over here 
and this diode is represented by a 0.7 volt uh, battery under the constant voltage model. So now we have three different uh, voltage sources. So now let's forget about the diode. Now assume that we have a 10 volt over here, we have 0.7 volt over here, and we have 20 volt over here with the polarities as shown. Now, since the anode terminal was connected downwards and the cathode terminal was connected upwards, so that's why this terminal is negative and this terminal is positive. So now, if we have to find out uh, the the diode current because of the three because of these three uh, voltage sources, then uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, associate. Okay, this one is source one. We can call this to be say source one. This to be say source two. And this to be say source uh, source uh, say let it be say source SD that is diode. So with S1, what we have already got like uh, one milliampere amount of current flowing downwards, and for S2 we have found that uh, two milliampere amount of current flowing upwards. So the same analysis is also applicable over here because what we have done that time we have made these two terminals this point and this point short circuited, and that you need to do whenever you are trying to get rid of the 0.7 volt battery because this is acting as an additional source over here so only the last that is is whenever is is present this diode is present then you have to find out what is the amount of current uh, then uh, how to uh, redraw the circuit very simple then this uh, diode will be acting alone i mean this 0.7 volt battery will be acting alone now and apart from this both of these two Voltage sources are to be made inactive. So since they are voltage source, so that's why they have short circuited. If you have a current source instead of voltage source, then it should be open circuited. So this is connected. This is connected like this. So we have a 10k resistance. We have another 10k resistance, and this one is 0.7 volt. So now what we can do is we can once again uh, simplify the circuit because we have a 10k, 10k in shunt path. Then ultimately the circuit looks something like that. It's like this. It's 5k only with 0.7 volt battery. It's 5k, 0.7 volt. So now uh, if I assume that okay this current. So obviously that this this will be the direction of the current. So if I call this current to be say ID, if I call this to be say ID current, uh, I think uh, I can use a different term. Anyway, then let's make it I is three. So will it become point eight? Any query? It like S3, I3. So that I3 will be like 0 0.7 volt divided by 5k, this much of milliampere. So if you just calculate, if you just calculate this one, let me just uh, calculate the value 0 0.7 divided by 5 volt. It's coming like. 0 0.14, 0 0.14 milliampere. 0 0.14 milliampere, that is the amount of current because of I3. So now, if I just uh, combine them together, I1, I2, and I3, what we find is I1, the value is 1 milliampere, and the direction was downwards. I2, it was 2 milliampere. Direction was upwards, and I3 is 0 0.14 milliampere, and the direction is also downwards. So the total current ID, what you can do is uh, assuming that uh, this direction is a positive direction, this I2 direction. So 2 minus 1.14. So ultimately, it will be a 0. Point 86 milliampere only. So last time it was uh, 
one milliampere. Now this time it is because of the constant voltage model. Now we have 0.86 milliampere only. Now with this, uh, let me give you another uh, uh, a little bit of let us uh, let's uh, add uh, another level of uh, complexity to the problem. That uh, if I just move once uh, one level further, that uh, instead of assuming constant voltage model, let us assume a practical diode model. So what happens for a practical diode model? So for a practical diode model. practical diode model i'm just uh, drawing the the final i mean okay anyway i can also complete the entire thing so, sir could you repeat the last slide which have you done over here uh, yeah yes sir How After to get getting I three, I three have found na this zero point seven volt divided by five k. Yes, sir. So this part that is zero point one four milliampere amount of current, and now uh, you have to apply the superposition theorem. I one and I two have already calculated, and the same calculation is also valid for this case, right? So already you have seen that I one uh, the direction is downwards, that is one milliampere. I two direction is upwards, is two milliampere. last time we we are uh, we have ended up with this i1 and i2 because we don't have any additional source so that's why the total current was i1 milliampere flowing upwards now this time we have apart from this one uh, we have additional component because of this 0.7 volt battery that is i mean uh, that is uh, internally present it's not uh, it's not a battery but uh, we have voltage source internally just like a diode so this is 0.7 volt so the current component is small 1.14 milliampere only We do have uh, the direction of the current is downwards. So now we have I1 acting downwards, I2 acting upwards, and I3 downwards. So what about the effective current? So if I assume that the upward direction is positive direction, so two milliampere and these two are uh, negative, so one and point one four, so one point one four. So two minus one point one four will give you zero point eight six milliampere. Okay. Now that value uh, might get changed. Whenever yeah, you assume some mm, a practical model of diode, so here uh, let me just show you. I won't uh, calculate. You can do the calculation. I'm just uh, giving you the hint. A practical diode model. Apart from this. You do have a resistance over here as well, the diode resistance. So now this one is uh, 10 volt, as before. This one is 20 volt. This to a 10k. This is 0.7. And now let's assume the sa same 10 ohms resistance. Okay. So one second, uh, I will uh, show you the result. Uh, anyway. Uh, Here uh, the situation will be uh, something different because uh, you cannot make it. I mean, these two points cannot be short circuited uh, during the calculation of S1 and S2 because now you have a 10 ohm resistance associated with that. Okay, so I will not show you the calculation, but uh, what I can show you, I can show you the the implication of the different uh, sources. So this is the case when. S1 is acting alone ten volt ten k ten k and ten ohms. It's very easy to find out the current. So let me call this kind is I1. This will be the direction I1. and uh, then uh, the second case when s2 is acting alone negative positive so now uh, this 0.7 volt battery i mean this, this 0.7 volt can be uh, uh, made inactive but this 10 ohms resistance uh, should be there To analyze the circuit, so 
so 10k 10k 10 ohms this is 20 volt and when uh, s3 uh, will be acting alone uh, then it will be something like that we have just like this so this will be between these two point you have only 10k resistance from this point to this point because both of these two voltage source 10 volt and 20 volt will be deactivated so we have 10k parallel combinations it will be simply 5k and we have 10 ohms resistance and we have minus 0 0.7 volt i mean 0 0.7 volt over the minus 2 plus now here let's assume that the current will be i2 and here you have to assume that the current is i3 in this direction and then you can find out the total current id as an algebraic sum of i1 i2 and i3 so as far as the direction is concerned you can write id as i2 minus i1 minus i3 so the calculation is left to you you can do the calculation but that will be the scenario for the practical diode model now with this uh, let me move to the uh, to the uh, another important aspect of uh, the diodes uh, that is with uh, the rectification aspect now let's start with uh, the very fundamental circuit of a rectifier what you need to do is that you have to draw the output waveform okay output waveform assuming that uh, once again uh, it's a silicon diode As you can understand, this circuit uh, is for a rectifier, half-wave rectifier, right? Uh, let's assume this is a 47 ohms resistance. And let us assume that over here, uh, we do have a sinusoidal voltage source. With the peak at and this is zero volt so plus five to minus five so the uh, voltage so it would have been better if i okay anyway no problem i understand that this one is at five and this one is at minus five the same excursion sinusoidal signal is there and you need to draw the output voltage so uh, this is the output voltage is obtained uh, between these two terminal i have to mention it as you understand, uh, it's a simple half-wave rectifier circuit. Only the positive half cycle uh, will be uh, available, will be appearing at the output, across the output, but the negative half cycle will be, will not be appearing, will be suppressed. So now uh, the same problem can be analyzed from two different perspectives. Let us assume initially that uh, we have ideal diode so if you have an ideal diode then obviously uh, for ideal diode uh, the positive half cycle will be available over here and uh, since uh, it's an ideal diode so there will be no voltage drop so what we can do is uh, we can write down the expression like so this v in is equal to vd plus v out so that voltage is vd and that voltage is v out and this voltage is v in so between this point we are applying v in this one is v in so minus to plus here plus to minus plus to minus so if you simply apply kvl so v in is equal to vd plus v out and for constant voltage model uh, for uh, ideal model uh, this vd will be equal to zero so V in will be called to V out only in the forward best condition. And the reverse best condition, there is no flow of current. So this is true in the forward best condition. Because the circuit gets computed over here. So what will be the output voltage? So the output voltage looks something like that. So V 
this is time this is b out so output voltage will be something like that during the positive half cycle you have the output and during the negative half cycle this is zero and this value is equal to 5 volt okay so this one is true for the ideal diode model so the peak will be at 5 volt but what happens for a constant voltage model so for constant voltage model what you need to do is that you have to identify that for constant voltage model this vd is non zero so this one is true for ideal model with ideal model you have vd is equal to zero and accordingly v is equal to v out in the forward bias condition now what happens with the constant voltage model now constant voltage model says that constant voltage model says that this vd must be equal to 0 0.7 volt assuming that the diode is a silicon diode so if it is 0 0.7 volt then obviously when the input is at 5 when the input is at its peak at 5 volt then the output should be at 5 minus 0 0.7 so it would have been better if i if i draw uh, this uh, for constant voltage model if i draw the input and output together uh, suppose let me draw the input first it's difficult to draw the sinusoidal signal anyway i've drawn to some extent correct so that is fine it's 5 volt over here your minus 5 volt over here it's riding on 0 dc that's fine but what happens what about the output voltage how does it look like so here when the input voltage reaches 0 0.7 volt then the output voltage will be equal to 0 volt so if the input is at 0 0.7 then the output will be at zero and then accordingly you can have here also always you will be having a zero point so this value uh, this difference must be 0 0.7 i mean this this peak is at 4.3 although a little bit exaggerated uh, to make sense this one is at 4.3 volt so unless and this voltage is i mean not this one difficult to understand anyway this voltage is 0 0.7 volt so when the input voltage is at 0 0.7 then the output starts from 0 and when the input voltage is at 5 then the output is 4.3 and it drops accordingly so here vd is equal to 0 0.7 volt so if i assume it's a constant voltage model so in that case uh, you have the peak little bit less as compared to the ideal model and accordingly if you have to find out the uh, the forward current peak forward current through the diode you can also find it out the peak forward current if peak so here we find if peak uh, i think shift it a little bit so here you can find out if peak the peak forward current under this uh, ideal model so here if peak will be nothing but you have a 5 volt over here that is a peak voltage and whatever the resistance that is 47 ohms so 5 volt divided by 47 ohms so let me do the calculation uh, it says that 
5 volt, that means 5000 millivolt divided by 47. So it gives like 106, roughly 106 milliampere, 106 point something. Okay, 106 milliampere. It seems that a little bit large. Anyway, so it's 106 milliampere. And what about IFT over here with uh, the constant voltage model? So here, the IF peak will be a little bit less because the peak value of the voltage is at 4.3. So 4.3 into 1000, that is 4300 divided by 47. So now you have 91.5 milliampere amount of current. So peak current gets restricted to a certain extent. And accordingly, uh, we have found that if we uh, introduce the constant voltage model, uh, then the peak current gets reduced from 106 to 91.5 milliampere. And you can also uh, incorporate the other model, that is the practical diode model. And in case of practical diode model, what you have is, apart from 0 0.7 uh, volt, uh, you do have another uh, battery, um, another resistance over here. So for the practical diode model, uh, the circuit will be something like that. So for the practical diode model, you have So uh, your final circuit will look something like that. So uh, you apply the input between these two terminal, V in, sinusoidal signal. You have some V gamma, you have some RD, dynamic resistance of the diode. And this one is, uh, how much? This one is load resistance you can consider, RL. You've got like 47 ohms. And to between these two points, we have to take the output. V out. So now, uh, if the current is flowing, let the current be say I. Let the current be I. So then you can write it down. V in is equal to V gamma plus V out or what you can do is uh, instead of writing V out you can write like V in is equal to V gamma plus I into Rd plus Rl and V out is given by I into RL. So if uh, V gamma is given to you, that is 0 0.7 volt, and if RD and RL, the values of these two are given to you, then you can uh, find out what about the peak value of the current. So let's assume that, uh, assume, uh, let's assume V gamma is equal to 0 0.7 volt, and uh, RD is equal to 10 ohms, and RL has been given like, uh, I think, 47, no? What you got last time? Yeah, 47 ohms. RL was 47 ohms. So then, uh, when uh, the V in is at 5, is at its peak, then what about the current? So now the peak current, that is I here, I have means the forward current that is flowing. You can also call this to be I F the forward current. So I F peak is given by when V in is at five, then it will be like V in peak minus V gamma divided by R D plus R M. That is equal to, you have 5 volt as V in peak, you have 0 0.7 volt as V gamma divided by 10 ohms plus 47 ohms. Normally, this uh, load resistance is, uh, is large with respect to the diode resistance, might be in the range of few kilo ohms, but here, uh, let's assume it's 47. 
So then uh, what you have is uh, 5 minus uh, 0.7, that is 4.3 volt, that is 4300 uh, millivolt divided by 57. And the result says that it is uh, 75 point something. So uh, 75 point 444 or 4 milliampere. So as you're introducing more complexity, I mean, as you are uh, going from the ideal model to the practical model of the diode, you're observing that uh, the peak value of the current is reducing. Initially, with uh, no uh, assumption, I mean, uh, assuming that the diode is ideal, uh, then the peak current was like 106 milliampere. Then with constant voltage model, the peak current uh, goes down to 91.5 milliampere with the diode uh, replaced by a, a battery only. And finally, uh, if you have the battery, and apart from that, if we have the resistance of the diode in account, uh, then it is coming like 75.4 uh, uh, milliampere for the same settings of uh, the input voltage and the value of the V gamma and the value of the load resistance. So that is 75.4 milliampere amount of current. That is the peak value of the output current. So as you can find, if you just change uh, the model, if you just move from the uh, ideal model to the constant voltage, constant voltage to the practical diode model. So uh, different uh, attributes are, are taken into consideration and accordingly it will affect the output voltage as well. Right. Because uh, now uh, if you can uh, uh, check uh, the output current, uh, we have found out like 75.4 milliampere, that is fine. Then what about the V out peak then? You can do this calculation as well. V out peak is like 75.4 milliampere is maximum amount of current that is flowing through this. So 75.4 milliampere into 0 0.001, that is milliampere. And then you have uh, RL uh, like uh, 47 ohms. So now uh, the calculation says that it's like 3.54 volt. So one thing you can compare this one with the, so initially you have, uh, with the ideal model, it was the peak was at five volt. Your input was five volt, peak was also five volt during the positive half cycle. The negative half cycle is completely uh, suppressed. There is no doubt about that. With the constant voltage model, it is coming like uh, 4.3 volt because a straight, straight away 7.7 .7 volt drop, so it will be like 4.3 volt. And for this one, it is coming like 3.54 volt. Because this time it is uh, given by IF into RL. And this time you cannot write uh, IF is equal to simply V in minus V gamma by RL. Because this time it is V in minus V gamma divided by RD plus RL. So ultimately, you found out that V out peak is coming like uh, 3.54 only. So your input was like five volt, but uh, the output peak was at max it is 3.54. So you can improve this one uh, just by increasing the value of the load resistance. That means we can get rid of the loading effect. So gradually as you, as you uh, as we will be moving towards uh, other units of this particular module, you might be understanding what is meant by the loading effect. So that is very pertinent in this particular case uh, because the value of RD and RL here is comparable. RD is equal to 10 ohms and RL is equal to 47 ohms. So since they are comparable, so that's why a significant drop you can observe over here. But even uh, with uh, this uh, practical diode model, if we use an RL value of say, say in the order of say 10 kilo ohms or 20 kilo ohms, then since uh, the value of RL is much, much larger uh, with respect to RD, in that case, you'll find that uh, this value will be very much close to 4.3 volt, even if uh, with uh, the practical diode model, because uh, if you just uh, uh, put the value over here, uh, V out, you'll find that it's nothing but V in minus V gamma divided by RD plus RL multiplied with RL. Okay, I think I should put a demarcation. Yeah. So V in minus V comma into RL upon RD plus RL. So this RL upon RD plus RL uh, will give you a kind of loading. And uh, this value, if you can make this value equal to a one, uh, so that is only possible if RD is equal to zero. Otherwise, if RD is much, much small as compared to RL, then you can 
uh, approximated to be one. So in that case, VR could have been 4.3 volt. Otherwise, since here RD, RD and RL they are comparable, so you find that there has been a significant uh, loss as compared to 4.3 last time. We have got like 3.54 volt. So that's a significant loss. Anyway, uh, so that is uh, that is the case uh, with a uh, half-wave rectifier circuit. And uh, uh, let's move to the next one, the full-wave bridge rectifier. A full wave bridge rectifier circuit. So let me draw the circuit first and then I will give the problem. We have a full wave bridge rectifier. Involving four diodes. RL. Uh, let me call this to be diode D1, this to be diode D2, this to be diode D3, this to be diode D4. So, uh, assume that uh, this transformer, uh, this uh, transformer uh, secondary will give you a 12 volt RMS over here. So, transformer secondary, so here you have the secondary, and we have a 12 volt RMS secondary voltage. 12 volt RMS, RMS term is very important. 12 volt RMS secondary voltage that is given, and uh, you need to find out the uh, the PIV ratings for the diodes. You need to find out the PIV ratings of the diodes and assume that uh, this RL is equal to 10 kilo ohms. RL is equal to 10 kilo ohms. And here you need to uh, assume that the practical diode model, that means uh, you do have the 0 0.7 volt between the anode to cathode, or in other words, you can also consider the constant voltage model of the diode. And what about the PIV rating? That is important. So PIV, as you understand, so this is uh, nothing but the AC mains. You should mention AC mains. So PIV uh, stands for peak inverse voltage. That means the maximum voltage that the diode can withstand under the reverse bias condition. That is known as the peak inverse voltage. Now here, first of all, you need to find out what about the peak value of the secondary, because the secondary uh, is having a 12 volt RMS. So what about the peak value of the secondary? So peak of the secondary, so I can call like VP secondary, that is a P stands for peak. So you know how to find out the, the peak value from the RMS value. It's nothing but for a sinusoidal voltage, the peak value can be obtained by multiplying this uh, RMS value with root two, that is 1.414. So root two times VRMS, VP RMS. And here it is uh, 12 volts, so root two into 12. So if you do the calculation, it will give you root 2 into 12 will give you 16.97. So uh, I, I may simply assume to be say 17 volt. A 
approximately 70 sir, so yeah sir will the uh, secondary voltage be given 12 volt ms ah uh, if this 12 volt if it is 12 volt rms then obviously for sinusoidal signal the peak will be 17 volt no no sir that's not the problem the secondary voltage will be given in the problem or we have to yeah it, it should be given yeah it should be given at least uh, I, either the, the peak value or the rms value it should be given otherwise you cannot calculate na it should be given yes sir yes sir provided so either the rms value or uh, the peak value normally rms value is given in many of the books you will find that only the rms value is given so from that you can so your first job is to calculate the peak value peak value of peak secondary is so what could have been the peak secondary that is uh, 16.9897 uh, so uh, you can simply assume to be 17 volt so now this is the peak secondary over here but what about uh, this output voltage so i forgot that uh, to mention that the output is obtained from so this is the output so let me just uh, so you'll be taking the output across this one so you'll be taking the v out over here only across the load resistance okay so now uh, uh, to understand the concept or notion of uh, this uh, peak inverse voltage peak inverse voltage means uh, you have to identify what about uh, the uh, condition of the diode, whether the diode is in the forward bias condition or in the reverse bias condition. And you have to apply the notion of uh, PIV only for the diodes operating in the reverse bias condition. So uh, now if we uh, move on and uh, if I just show you. So the negative terminal of the output is always grounded. Which one? This, this one. Yes, the negative one terminal one. of the output. Or otherwise, if, uh, I mean, uh, these two points are connected to it. In fact, the current will flow in this way. The current will flow in this way. When this one is positive with respect to this one, when this terminal is positive with respect to this one, then the D1 and D2 will be on during the positive half cycle. So the current will be flowing through D1, RL, D2, and back to over here. And when the, the negative terminal, I mean, during the negative half cycle, uh, then D3 and D4 will be on. Right, then the current will be flowing through this path, through D4, through load resistance, because uh, since the load resistance is connected over here, so you can visualize that this RL is connected between this point and this point, because this is also grounded, this, is also, this, is, uh, this point is also grounded. So that means uh, this RL is connected between this D1, D4 junction and D3, D2 junction. So during the positive half cycle, the current will flow like this, this, this path, this, this, back over here and during the negative half cycle the current will flow through this this and this back over here so the current is unidirectional so you always find that the current is unidirectional over here so i would like to uh, emphasize only the four diodes right now and what happens during the positive half cycle the role will be reversed for the negative half cycle. So let me explain the positive half cycle. So this is grounded, right? This is grounded and you have load resistance over here and this voltage is V out, plus minus V out. So during positive half cycle, as I have mentioned already, D1 and D2 they will be acting so i am uh, marking with uh, green that means they will be on during the positive half cycle and d3 and d4 they are off so this one is d3 this one is d4 so during the positive half cycle d1 and d2 will be on and d3 and d4 will be off so now if uh, if i assume that constant voltage model so obviously uh, now if the diodes are on so you must understand that uh, under constant voltage model so there will be a 0 0.7 volt drop between these two terminals, anode to cathode. Here also, 0 0.7 volt drop. That is fine. And we have nothing to do with this 0 0.7 volt. What I need to find is, we have to find out the peak inverse voltage. That means, here you find the output voltage during the positive half cycle, it will look something like that. During positive half cycle, so I may call, uh, say, 0 to T by 2. I don't know the period, so that's a T by 2 half period. So when this is at its peak, 
when the output is at its peak over here you find this positive peak is applied at the cathode of d4 and the anode of d4 is having a potential is equal to minus 0.7 volt because this potent this point is at ground this point is at ground this point is at ground ground potential and here to he here you have 0.7 volt drop so obviously this potential will be equal to minus 0.7 volt so when during the positive half cycle uh, let me uh, side by side uh, draw the the input wave form so the input wave form of looks like this so we are talking about this point we are talking about this point this point so when the input reaches at its peak this is the output pattern fine and this potential is also applied i mean this is connected to the cathode terminal of d4 this is connected to the cathode terminal of d4 and what about the anode terminal so anode terminal is having a potential of minus 0.7 volt because d2 is conducting and this is the time when the input reaches at its peak this is the time when the maximum reverse voltage is being applied across d4 the same thing is also applicable for d3 as well so this is the time the maximum voltage are being applied across d4 then the piv rating of the diode has to be greater than this value minus this value because now you have to calculate what about the anode to cathode voltage obviously that voltage would be negative because anode is negative with respect to cathode so that's why the diode d4 is in reverse bias condition as you find here the anode is having a negative voltage of minus 7 minus 0.7 volt and cathode is having a voltage of some positive voltage like this and since it is 17 volt now you have to identify what about this voltage what about the peak output voltage i think it would be better if i move to the next uh, next r okay let me let me stay in this slide only now if the peak is at uh, 17 volt then you understand that there is uh, there are two different drops of 0.7 volt because the current will flow like this d1 through rl and then through d2 and back over here so there are two different drops of the diode okay, across the diodes 0.7 volt each so uh, you can find out the peak voltage of the output so the peak voltage of the output vp out peak voltage of the output is not equal to the vp secondary rather it is vp secondary that is peak of the secondary voltage minus the two drops that is 1.4 volt 0.7 volt 0.7 volt each assuming the constant voltage model so 0.7 volt into 2 so two drops will take place and ultimately it will be uh, 1.4 minus so 17 minus 1.4 I uh, will give you 15.6 volt. So that value is equal to 15.6 volt. You have to identify this one is 15.6 volt. So this value, whatever the input voltage, you don't know the trans ratio. Whatever this value, I don't know anything about that. But I know uh, this VP secondary, and this value is 15.6 volt. The peak is 15.6 volt, and that is connected to the cathode terminal of D4. And whatever the anode terminal, this is connected to minus. 0.7 volt because this is at ground and we have 0.7 volt drop over here so the anode to cathode voltage is negative or in other words the cathode to anode voltage is positive so what about the maximum cathode to anode voltage over here so this vka what i can do is vka max that is equal to the that should be the piv and that is nothing but this voltage this cathode voltage minus the anode voltage so what about the cathode voltage 15.6 volt what about the anode voltage minus 0.7 volt so it will be 16.3 volt 15.6 plus 0.7 that is 16.3 volt so the diode must withstand the 16.3 volt that means the peak inverse voltage rating of the diode should be at least 16.3 so it can be greater than that it can be 18 volt 20 volt 25 volt 30 volt but can't be less than 16 volt if the peak inverse voltage rating is less than 16 volt uh, then the diode cannot withstand 
this amount of negative voltage and ultimately uh, there will be a breakdown situation so uh, that has to be avoided and uh, that you can get uh, from this particular calculation now here we have uh, assumed that the constant voltage model so that's why uh, uh, we have to take into account two 0.7 volt drop that is 1.4 volt and accordingly you have to calculate uh, the peak value of the output voltage and uh, the situation will be reversed whenever uh, you do the calculation during the negative half cycle during the negative half cycle you find that d1 and d2 will be off and d3 and d4 will be on and accordingly following the same methodology you can find out here also since all the assuming that all the diodes are identical all of them are having a 0.7 volt drop whenever they are acting or whenever they are on so there also you will find that the same value of pip that is 16.3 volts so the minimum value of the peak inverse voltage should be at least 16.3 volt now Uh, sir, uh, sir uh, can you please explain the uh, positive half cycle once again? Yes. Uh, during the positive half cycle, what happens? During the positive half cycle, uh, I think, okay, I, I, I don't want to draw the circuit again. Once again. So during the positive half cycle, this terminal is much more positive with respect to this terminal. Okay. So what you find is D one and D two. they will be in the forward bias condition and d3 and d4 they are in the reverse bias condition because the anode of d1 is connected to this point and this point is much more positive with respect to this particular potential so d1 will be on yes and sir, yes sir. Be on. so the kind of d1 rl and d2 during the positive half cycle and then d3 and d4 will be off so that's why they are marked with red during the negative half cycle what happens is during the negative half cycle this this point if i call this point as point b and this point as point a during the positive half cycle uh, let me let me mark those two points so let me call this as point a and let me call this as point b so during the positive half cycle the potential at point a is higher as compared to the potential at point b so therefore d1 and d2 will be on and accordingly the current will flow through this path and during the negative half cycle uh, point b is having a higher potential as compared to point a so therefore d4 and d3 will be on d4 and d3 will be on and the current will be flowing in the same direction from this point to this point that means from this point to this point so the direction of the current through the resistance rl will be unidirectional that means it will always flow from this point to ground both in the positive half cycle as well as in the negative half cycle in neither of the case you will find that the current will be flowing from this point to ground from ground to this point so this is not at all possible so since the direction of the current is uniform so therefore the output will look something like that so here uh, you will find the output will be something like that unidirectional flow now in connection to that uh, i have uh, come across uh, uh, one doubt uh, at the very beginning of the class uh, somebody has asked that what is paid by ac ripple output so in connection to that uh, let me just uh, uh, give, give you the query i mean the uh, with respect to that uh, let me just uh, identify this one as a, a full wave rectifier might be a simple center tap uh, full wave rectifier or a bridge rectifier but the thing is that i would like to visualize this full wave rectifier as a black box and let us try uh, to have uh, what is there what is happening you are providing an input like this Uh, now uh, let us assume that uh, this is uh, riding on zero dc this is riding on zero dc so uh, this axis i think it would be better if i draw the axis separately if i draw the axis separately and uh, let us uh, impose uh, the wave form on it so let's assume that it is riding on zero dc simple sinusoidal signal mm -hmm. 
might be 5 volt to minus 5 volt. Okay. What you are getting over here, the output of the full wave rectifier, the waveform like this one. So this is T. This is V in. This is V out. T. Now, uh, what you are getting is uh, at the output of the full wave rectifier, it will look something like that. So, if you just compare uh, this one with this one, these two output, I mean, input and output, here you find that since the input is riding on a zero DC, it's like uh, say uh, a sine omega t or five sine omega t. So, that, that means uh, for a sinusoidal signal, if you take the average value over a single period, uh, the average will be zero. So the DC value for the input signal is equal to zero. However, for this one, the DC value is non-zero. You can easily calculate the DC value. Uh, I'm not going into the calculation, the detail part, uh, but uh, hopefully you'll be knowing how to calculate the DC value. So the DC value, uh, the average value can be calculated like this. You find that, okay, the same thing gets repeated. So what we can do is, I can uh, do the integration from uh, zero to T by two where T by two is the half time period and T is the full time period. And we have V out as a function of T, dt. This is the integration and in order to find out the average value, you have to multiply this with one by T and the same thing has to be multiplied with two because the same thing gets repeated. So ultimately, this will be the expression for the VDC, 2 by T, integration 0 to T by 2, V out T dt. And if I call uh, that value uh, is at Vm, then you can readily uh, check that uh, this uh, average value is coming like 2 Vm by pi. So I'm not going to the calculation of that. So what I uh, want to tell you, uh, the, the extract of this uh, observation, that the input voltage here, you see that input voltage is riding on zero DC, but the output voltage is not riding on zero DC. You have some DC value, whose value is equal to Vm by pi. So if I if I consider five, uh, I mean, Vm to be say five volt, then it is like 10 divided by mm. pi, that is 3.14. So it is coming like 3.18. So with Vm is equal to five volt, so VDC or V average, that is equal to, is coming like 3.18 volt, 3.18 volt with VM is equal to five volt. So if VM is equal to five volt, if the peak is at five volt, uh, then the uh, average value, the DC value is non-zero and that is 3.18 volt. You can also visualize from a different perspective. Uh, if you just calculate the area under the curve, you'll see that here you have a positive area and here you have a negative area. And uh, this positive and the negative area, they are same. So obviously the DC value is equal to non-zero, uh, zero here for the input signal. Now for the output signal, you find that if you just calculate, irrespective of the value of the VM, this is obviously non-zero because you don't have any provision of negative area. Always it is upward. So you have some positive value and that can be calculated like this 3.18 volt. So now, uh, this waveform, uh, the output waveform, what you have, what you have obtained like this, which is uh, like this, we have an output waveform like this, T versus V out. So now we have a separate representation of the same output voltage. So far, we have uh, we have shown the output as a unidirectional. That means uh, the variation of the output voltage is always uh, positive with respect to the ground line, with respect to the zero value. So once we have the DC value, now we can have, now we can shift, uh, we can shift the, uh, the reference. So then uh, what we can uh, do is, now we have, this is the ground line, I mean the zero reference. Okay, fine, V out. Now, this is the average value, the DC value. 
which is equal to 3.18 volt. Now let us mark this 3.18 volt over here. So now this is going to be my new reference. This is going to be a new reference. Now with respect to this new reference, with respect to this new reference, now I can redraw this output voltage, this one, in a different manner. That means, what I can do is, uh, let me just, it should be a little bit more. Let me draw like this, yeah, might be like this. So this was the, the uh, graph with this blue is your actual output voltage. And now if we just represent this output voltage as we are going to represent V out as VDC plus some VAC. This AC, VAC part will give you the notion of ripples present in the output. So how to get this VAC? So that can be simply obtained by uh, subtracting VDC from V out. So already you have V out over here. So V out, that is the red, I mean the blue one. And VDC is the, I mean, I think it would be better if I just change the color, then it would be better for you uh, to visualize as well. So this one is green, so VDC. plus some VAC. So how to find out this VAC? This is nothing but V out minus VDC. So uh, you have to subtract this green from the blue. You have to subtract this green from the blue. And accordingly, you have a fluctuation like this. So uh, it would be difficult for me to uh, find out uh, the exact value. Anyway, uh, over here, uh, this is the peak, so it will be less than peak. So ultimately, what you have is, let me just show you separately. How does this VAC look like? So it is nothing but V out minus VDC. Okay. So VAC is equal to V out minus VDC. So you have to subtract this one, this VDC from this one. So obviously initially uh, at this particular point, uh, your V out is equal to zero, but VDC is obviously non-zero is 3.18 volt. So obviously uh, the fluctuation will be something like that ultimately. You have a DC shifting. And like this. Little bit exaggerated. So that value is obvious minus VDC. Somebody is trying to enter the class. So that value should be minus VDC initially. We just calculate this one. This should be VDC. Because when V out is equal to zero volt, then VAC should be minus VDC because VAC is equal to V out minus VDC. So zero minus VDC, zero minus VDC. So it starts with minus VDC and accordingly the variation is something like that. And this component is known as the ripple component or AC ripple component of the output. So we can visualize the output waveform, this output waveform, as you have seen over here, this one, from two different perspectives, as a combination, as a summation of two different signals. One is the DC component, the average value, and second one is the AC component, which has its fluctuation in the positive direction as well as in the negative direction. Right, and accordingly, 
our objective in the design of any uh, pool wave rectifier circuit is to minimize the ripple to some extent because ultimately our objective is to provide a constant dc value which is very difficult to achieve uh, with a, a full wave rectifier and accordingly uh, you know that there are different types of performance metrics like ripple factor form factor by means of which you can understand how much the circuit performs well so as you know from the uh, as you move from the half wave rectifier circuit to the full wave rectifier circuit you will see that the performance in reducing the ripple count is better because uh, we find there in the corresponding ripple factor that particular thing gets improved as you are moving from the half wave to the full wave and uh, once again if you incorporate apart from a simple resistance if you incorporate some uh, capacitive uh, uh, filter over here uh, at the output uh, then it to some extent it can improve uh, the ripple behavior because the capacitor can uh, store the charge and accordingly the output voltage uh, cannot reduce drastically rather the variation uh, can be smooth to some extent can be made smooth to some extent so uh, that is a different aspect but uh, what i mean to say is that uh, our objective here uh, in the design of any uh, rectifier circuit is to uh, minimize the ripple component of the uh, output signal so uh, with this uh, i would like to uh, uh, conclude uh, our today's discussion uh, tutorial class uh, on the first two uh, lectures of this electronic circuit.